from South Carolina Public Radio, this is Walter Edgar's Journal. I'm Walter Edgar, welcoming you to our podcast series about South Carolina culture and history with a nod to all things Southern. Today, Alfred Turner and I will be talking with Kevin Kokomore from Coastal Carolina University about his book, La Florida, Catholics, Conquistadors, and Other American Origin Stories. In La Florida, Kevin explores a Spanish thread to early American history that is unfamiliar or even unknown to most Americans and reveals that it was Spanish influence, not English, which drove America's early history. In our conversation today, we'll dig deeper into Hispanic and Caribbean history and the important happenings elsewhere in the Spanish colonial world that influenced the discovery and colonization of the American Southeast. Kevin, it's good to have you with us here on the journal today. And uh, first of all, let's talk a little bit about you. You are a native Floridian. Where in Florida did you grow up? That's right. So I was born in Jacksonville, but really early uh, within a couple months of me being born, my my family moved down to southwest Florida. So this little town between Fort Myers and Sarasota called Inglewood. And so that's where I grew up, um, went to high school. Uh, And then I actually went to college at the University of South Florida in Tampa. I got my degree in history there, and I got my master's in history there. And then I went to Florida State to get my Ph.D. in early American history. Okay. And then you somehow ended up uh, in Conway, South Carolina. Absolutely. Uh, First job out of grad school was working at uh, Coastal Carolina University. And so I moved up here from Tampa. I moved back to Tampa to write the dissertation. And I moved, um, I got the call and packed up everything and moved here in 2012, and I've been here ever since. Okay. And the title of your book is La Florida, and uh, I love the subtitle, Catholics, Conquistadors, and Other American Origin Stories, uh, in which you basically take on the Anglo world uh, and turn it upside down. I try, yes. And that's that's sort of the subtitle is hidden in there, American Origin Stories. The introduction and the conclusion really lays that out by talking about what I consider to be the or a mythology about America's founding, that essentially anything that's important comes from New England or comes from Puritans. And and that's that sort of leaves out a lot. Well, it, it also leaves out. The, the rest of the Anglo world. Uh, mm-hmm. But anyway, let's just start off with the first Thanksgiving. The Virginians, of course, say it happened at Jamestown, but somehow the pilgrims are given the credit for the first Thanksgiving. But there was a very interesting first Thanksgiving in Florida, and I particularly like what they were thankful for. Y- yeah, absolutely. So there's actually several days that they claimed to be giving thanks. Um, and some of them makes sense. Crossing the Atlantic, showing up in St. Augustine, you would give thanks for that. One of the Thanksgivings where Pedro Menendez de Avilas basically says, we dined and fed the natives, which would be objectively, I guess you could say, the first Thanksgiving. That would have been one of those days. But the two other Thanksgiving days, you know, they were celebrating some some real violence, uh, this incredibly violent story of their destruction of the Huguenots just to the south. Yes. Part of the story of La Florida is control of the southeastern United States, uh, in which South Carolina, of course, plays a role. Before you came on the scene, I used to enjoy telling folks from Florida that the first capital of La Florida was actually in South Carolina at Santa Elena. It was not at St. Augustine, Mm -hmm. uh, which some of the folks at St. Augustine still don't get. We tell the same story about the real Thanksgiving is actually in Florida, and that just passes through people relatively easily. It's uh, it's an oddity, and then everyone more or less goes back to the Puritan pilgrim world. So, yeah, that is um, Santa Elena was was supposed to be the success story, and it and and so it it was actually seen as being more important than Saint Augustine, and just a bad circumstance. With uh, Drake's raid in 1586, they basically decide to give up on Santa Elena and focus on St. Augustine, which everyone sort of hated at the time, but that's the way it turned out. Yeah. Santa Elena really was a very successful little town. Uh, It was a military outpost, that's true. But one of the things that 
I loved about looking at Spanish records is the Spaniards kept incredible records. So when they abandoned Santa Elena, we knew what the housewife took with her. They didn't take all the pigs because they got loose, and that was an important part of the story of what the Spaniards left in South Carolina. They left peaches, by the way, and pigs. And oranges. I believe there are oranges all the way up uh, at one point into Georgia and South Carolina. They didn't last really long. Well, actually, they were growing oranges commercially in in Charleston in the 1740s. And then we had two years of hard freezes, and that put quietus on the, mm-hmm. on the oranges. The worst legacy that was left for all of the native peoples, the disease. There's a there's a rocky and pretty violent and contested relationship out of Santa Elena. That's one of the first mission provinces is Orista that goes up there, and that doesn't last long. That's done. That's That's been overthrown by the 1590s. But you still, like you said, you have these Osabal hogs that are the direct descendants of some of the pigs that were left. And uh, in general, yes, you know, you— you have the religious documents, you have the civil documents, and the Spaniards are, are absolutely notorious bureaucrats. So I actually point to church records um, several times over the course of this book to, to really draw out these multi-ethnic, multicultural communities that existed in the Southeast, existed in, in Spanish colonial towns, because Spanish colonial towns were multi-ethnic, multi-racial places. They were not places of equality, but they were still multi-ethnic and multi-racial. And some of the, the best, uh, most enduring evidence that you see from that are these baptismal records, for instance. And the, the baptismal records in St. Augustine, which are were assiduously kept, they were uh, well-kept and that they were kept to make sure that the caste system stayed strong. So it's it's a history of exploitation, but it still exists, and it and it demonstrates a, a pretty vibrant town. We're talking about Nombre de Dios, right? The the church there, the which is the oldest church in the United States. Yes, and in those churches, and in the chapels, and in the missions, is where these friars would. Baptize and and they would baptize uh, enslaved um, Africans. They would baptize natives. They would baptize Castilians. They would baptize everyone. Um, they would baptize them in the exact same sanctuary. And so they would keep these really detailed records. Who's your father? Who's the mother? Where's the line? And those have been really helpful over time. I was going to say that must be a treasure trove for a historian to mine. In, in about midway through the book, you know, I, I basically point out that we have documentation that says you have an enslaved African mother, an enslaved African father, and they're, then they baptize the child in 1603 or even in 1595. And you're looking at a document like that and saying that is pretty irrefutable evidence that not only did slavery exist in Florida before it existed in Virginia, but there's actually a Creole population. There is an African-American population. I mean, this is a growing place where you have multi-generational families. The friars who were doing the baptizing would talk about mixed race with our, the Spaniards that already defined as mestizo and what have you. Absolutely. There's there's several levels, and I know a lot of these terms are anachronistic, but they are terms that define someone's Christian blood, essentially. And this goes back to la limpieza de sangre, like the, the cleanliness of blood. I mean, what you think of as an actual caste system, it would be written down in the documents. And so, yes, when you have a mother and a father— uh, and you have the birth and baptism of a baby. It's not just their names. It's their names. It is who their parents are. It is what position in society. So there are mestizos. There are pardos, which would be free um, people of African American descent. And so, yeah, that that turns out to be very helpful because they obviously didn't design it in that way. But it actually it actually provides a really accurate cross section of what's going on in that town. All right, let's talk about how and why Spaniards came here in the first place. My elementary history book talked about, you know, Ponce de Leon looking for the Fountain of Youth, De Soto making his uh, expedition. I grew up in Mobile on the Gulf Coast, and of course, Isabel de Soto was waiting in Mobile Bay for Hernando to get there, and he, he never did. Anyway, the Spaniards, why are they here? Well, there are several 
sort of overlapping reasons. Uh, one is the church, certainly. They are in the very, very earliest years of conquest. The church plays uh, a, a tremendous role. They, they play a role in setting up the encomienda system. They, 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 they play a role in basically the forced conversion of natives. And then that sort of changes a little bit when the Franciscans sort of come in. It's more of a mission system that is not supposed to be directly tied to an encomienda, uh, a labor system, although it, it usually still is. So, so the church plays an incredible role. In fact, the church plays an incredible role even when natives are not involved. And so Pedro Menendez de Aviles is there basically on behalf of the church. He's there not only to kick out French pirates, but to kick out French Protestants. So one of those threads that goes all the way to the beginning is the church. Also, these are conquistadors. These are, this is a very unique, very violent, very aggressive set of men who are looking for glory and they're looking for riches. And in a lot of ways, the conquest of the Caribbean is an extension of a war that they had been fighting for hundreds of years, the Reconquista. And I like to teach my students in class, actually, that, that in 1492, when, when Columbus comes back from the Caribbean, the conquest of Granada has just happened in 1492. And so the end of this 800-year war has just taken place. And it really creates this almost existential crisis for this warrior class that would not exist if it wasn't for war. And everything that they had gained was through basically taking it from someone else. So not only is the church involved, but there is power and glory to be made. And so it's just an inescapable draw that just sucks these guys in. So Ferdinand and Isabella want to get rid of these aggressive people. They send them out in the world. Go do something somewhere else. Yeah, now, somewhere far away. Yeah. And some of the folks who were involved in the first connections with La Florida were veterans of particularly Pizarro's efforts in South America. That is actually a really important connection that I make for the first third of the book, is that everyone that tries uh, in the Southeast, and La Florida is, is not just the peninsula, but most of the early American Southeast at one time, everyone who tries to make a fortune there has already tried and either failed or it just hasn't really worked out. And that is Juan Ponce de Leon. He is snubbed in, the, in a governorship. He is successful, but he wants to be more successful. And so he moves from Puerto Rico and Hispaniola up to Florida. The exact same is Lucas Vasquez de Ayon. He is a successful sort of lawyer and politician in Hispaniola, but he, he wants to get in on sort of conquest and he wants to be an encomendero. So he makes his shot in South Carolina. Uh, Pamphilo de Narvaez is snubbed by Cortez. And so he wants his shot at glory. Hernando de Soto is second under Pizarro. So in every in every one of these stories, one of the one of the most important connections is that everyone that comes to La Florida, and most of them end up dying trying, everyone that comes there is willing to wage their fortunes, their name, their glory. They they want to that they want to be the next Cortez, the next Pizarro. Yes, which means lining their pockets and that of the of the crown with silver and gold. Of course, the DeSoto story, which folks here in South Carolina are pretty familiar with, he's looking clearly looking for gold because that's what the natives in Florida tell him to get to get him out. You know, keep going north, and then of course he ends up in Cofita Chiki, and you, you do cover that story very nicely about we always refer to her as the Queen of Cofita Chiki, but the chiefess, and she presented him not with gold but with baskets of freshwater pearls. But it seems like, and this was, I thought, an interesting twist, he really was looking for food by this time. The natives themselves evidently had been through several years of not very good harvest, and that was something they were not really happy to share. That's right. So in the Mississippian Southeast, and it doesn't have to be a massive Mississippian society like a Paramount Cheetah, like you think of like Cahokia, but they are corn-based societies. And this is Again, this is this is a connection that's made throughout other attempts at conquest is that a guy like Hernando de Soto sees people in powerful positions. He sees mound architecture. And in his mind, that equals gold and silver because that has been his experience. And so he moves hopscotches, one Mississippian society after another, just thinking that the next one in his mind, when you see an all-powerful godlike ruler, there is a gold mine 
or a silver mine nearby. And of course, in the Mississippi and Southeast, the nature of their power is not gold and silver. It never was gold and silver anywhere else, but the nature of their power is corn agriculture. So you can imagine that he gets angrier and angrier as he's traipsing through the Southeast. And the irony is that, is that yes, that when he gets to Kafitachiki, he is, there are just accounts of just pearls by the millions of freshwater pearls, but that's not enough for him. He did not, he did not wager his family name and his fortune on pearls is what he says. And he pushes on because by that time, you're right, the natives are, are keen on what can get him out of their communities the fastest. And that is saying, hey, if you're looking for something that's shiny and silver and gold looking, it's the next community down the road. And they actually get pretty good at that in the early years from Appalachia onwards. The, the, the natives wise up to him real quick. And, and then again, what he does do is devastate these communities, even when there's not incredible violence, as there is in some. What he does do is eat everything. And so at a place like Cafetachiki, where we have evidence, it could have been a disease, it could have been bad weather, but they had really bad harvests and they were struggling. And then his men come in and they're like locusts that just come in for months at a time and just eat everything. And well, when, let's talk about how large DeSoto's band was. Hundreds. Hundreds. With horses. And and they everywhere they went, they were let's just say they were enslaving Native Americans as to carry the Spaniards weren't toting the baggage that they were forcing Native Americans to do that. Yeah, they would call them laborers, but in reality they were enslaving them. And we have evidence of the entire run of how that could look. In some in some instances they went along willingly, in some instances they were literally chained together and drug along until they died. And so Yes, they, they did not carry their own supplies, but they did also drag hundreds of pigs with them. They had hundreds of horses with them. And whenever they stopped at these communities, not only would they force these native chieftains to, to feed them using their corn stores, but they would literally release the horses out into the countryside. And the horses would just just strip all, all anything that they were growing or anything that grew wild. Like in the southeast, they would talk about mulberries or blackberries or strawberries, and they would just absolutely wipe them out. The pigs would wipe them out. And in, in every possible way, they would basically strip a native uh, community of almost everything that they could eat. And the only reason DeSoto moved on was, he would say, was there was nothing left to eat. And, of course, he's leaving behind uh, the microbes. Pigs and horses. And we know that pigs escape, and we know that these are the vectors of malaria and influenza and yellow fever and basically all of the diseases that historically we know move through the South. And this is this is one of the first really important connections and transformations is that it gets worse the more you connect the Southeast to the Atlantic world. So it gets worse when Virginia is on the scene. It gets worse when New Englanders are around. It gets worse with South Carolina. The more connection you have to the Atlantic world, the more constant influx of disease with the, the opening of these ports and transatlantic trade. But it really begins with the Spanish. They're the first. You, you use the term Colombian exchange, which other scholars have. You want to explain that for our listeners? These pigs and these horses, uh, they're the first time the natives have seen animals like this because the natives built their societies around corn agriculture. And basically everywhere in what you would call the old world, according to the Columbian Exchange, Africa, Eurasia, basically everywhere else, they build their societies based around some crops it are not unimportant, but domesticated animals. And domesticated animals living in close proximity get you sick. And getting sick over the course of thousands of years builds an immune system, and natives don't ever go through that process. And so they are forced to go through that process very, very rapidly. And it is when horses and sheep and pigs and chickens and people of European descent and people of African descent, they're carrying diseases with them, and they just move through in waves. It's one wave after another after another. And each wave could create anywhere from 20 to 50 percent mortality. And so it's not just one event. It's event after event after event. How many indigenous people were living in La Florida before Spanish intervention? This is actually pretty contested stuff, even in the 21st century. There are some figures uh, that would place a million 
um, just in the peninsula. Uh, those seem a little bit high, but it would definitely be in the hundreds of thousands just in the peninsula of Florida. And so in the larger southeast, it would be millions. And one of the real problems we have is that there, after DeSoto is gone, it, you have another attempt in the 1550s from Pensacola. You have another attempt from San Marcos to Appalachia in the 17th century. But we really don't have a lot of firsthand primary source evidence. So – we have DeSoto who moves through the region, and then we don't really have any idea what happens over the next 200 years. But then when the French are coming down the Mississippi, when the French are on the Gulf Coast, when the Spanish are on the Gulf Coast, when the English show up, we look at what DeSoto saw, and we look at what everyone sees in the 17th century, and it's fundamentally different. The nature of societies are fundamentally different. And what we know now is the native Southeast, the Cherokees, Creeks, Chickasaws, Choctaws, Seminoles. I mean, they really are the refugee remnant groups of the collapse of the Mississippian world. And the Mississippian world was prone to collapse because it's a society built off just corn. And we know that in the Southeast, if it's 100 percent agriculture, there's all sorts of natural things that could go wrong that would cycle these towns out. But add disease to that. We don't know what happened. But but the guess is that it had a devastating impact on the Southeast. Well, Nutritionally, corn is not something to base your diet on. These these Mississippian places, even small Mississippian chiefdoms, were extremely reliant on corn, maybe in 90% of their calories or 80% of their calories. The Three Sisters, squash and beans, we know that they grew them, but did they grow enough to make up for the lack of meat? And in general— they're not eating a well-balanced diet. They're not hunting as much as they should. They're not getting as much protein as they should. And corn lacks a lot of vitamins and minerals and protein and fiber, and it's good for energy, but it's not good for a whole lot else. And so if these societies are are eating just corn, then that's problematic nutritionally speaking, and it's problematic stability speaking, because if you knock that leg out, there's nothing else to depend on. So – the image we have of Native, Native Americans and even those in the Southeast of basically being hunters and gatherers, you know, venison, turkeys, pecans, walnuts, whatever, blackberries, living off the land, basically, it's not a correct image. It, it is in some communities. So in the Southeast, you have both of these levels of sophistication. You have Eastern Woodland, and Eastern Woodland is what you think of when you think of growing corn, beans, and squash one-third of the year, hunting one-third of the year, and then basically surviving the winter one-third of the year. And that seasonal lifestyle is more of what you think of when you think of New England. But along the coast, and in Florida, they still live like that, and along the coast, if you think of the PD or the Waccamaw, those native peoples close to the coastal plains, they are eastern woodland. But in the southeast and on the Mississippi River, the American bottom region, the ability to grow corn is is so strong because you can still grow a ton of corn out there that their societies basically grow so much corn, they begin to, they are forced to rely on corn and it creates this almost negative feedback loop where they their societies are bigger, they're more urban, they're denser, but it's also more problematic because they have built such huge populations, tens of thousands in some areas, that they can only support that population on corn. So the Southeast is a very vibrant place in, in the native world. And you have both. You have the woodland, which is more living seasonally. But what DeSoto sees and what he wants to see are the Mississippian places. And that's where he goes. And those are the ones that are more susceptible to collapse when he moves through. So an, an important idea of the book is that even though La Florida is only as big as the Southeast for a brief span of time, they can't control it. Other groups, other colonizing groups like the French and the British come in, but there still is an influence there, even when Florida shrinks down to just St. Augustine, and then it grows a little bit to St. Augustine and Appalachia and then Pensacola. It still influences the Southeast. And even though it's a book on the Spanish presence, Charleston is all over the place in that book because the British in Charleston and the Spanish in St. Augustine, I mean, they were just inveterate foes in, in every way possible. They are constantly struggling with each other. They're fighting each other. The South Carolinians basically swoop in and destroy St. Augustine using their native allies as soon as they get the chance. And so 
one of the bigger ideas in the book is that even though La Florida is basically nothing more than St. Augustine after about, after about the 18th century, it still is important because it, because it drives people's thoughts and people's fears. Un- until 1763, when it became English, it was always a threat. You can read the council documents in South Carolina, and they not only were concerned with the Spanish in St. Augustine, they were concerned with the French at Fort Toulouse and Mobile, because all of that had an impact on the deerskin trade uh, that made early South Carolinians very, very wealthy. Yeah, and the inability of the English and then the British to take St. Augustine, it is just a source of Tremendous bitterness for years, but uh, after the Castillo was built, after, you know, and so that's late 17th century, that's 1680s. We're talking now about that lovely Coquina stone fortress that they built. It's beautiful. Yeah. Twice, at least, the South Carolinians went in and burned almost everything else, but they never could take the castle. Yeah, that's um, when when I think Robert Searles um, in the 1680s comes in and just sails right past this dilapidated wooden fort and burns St. Augustine for like the 10th time. The Spanish authorities basically look at each other and go, well, if we're going to take this place seriously, we have to actually put money into it and build a fortress. They begin cutting this limestone and coquina and oyster shells, and, and they make this really incredible fortress, and it pumps so much money into the local economy. It really is sort of like the boom time to be in St. Augustine, because basically it's a blank check to, to build this fortress. And it takes a long time, even though the British come in and devastate the larger southeast uh, James Moore comes in, and then Oglethorpe comes in, and then you know there's invasion after invasion after invasion, and they do all these terrible things to St. Augustine and the missions, but they never come close to even taking the Castillo. Even up through the Revolution, even past the part where I talk about in this book, even up the Americans are trying to take the Castillo when it's British, and then when it becomes Spanish, the Americans try to take it when it's back to being Spanish. And over the course of then hundreds of years, they can never beat the Castillo de San Marcos. It just is always there. It's, it's unique. I hate to do this, but we need to sort of start wrapping it up. So I've got a question. Just to summarize, is it fair to say that when the British started coming into South Carolina, particularly Charleston uh, and, and further down the coast, they found a different world than they would have had the Spanish not come to the southeast? The best example I can give of that is that even though the first years of missionizing natives is in, is incredibly violent, and the Jesuits and the Dominicans don't stay. Uh-huh. By the time the British are in Charleston in 1670, there are mission districts, and they have been there for a while, and they are the pride of the Spanish Franciscan mission network. And this has a, a tremendous depopulating, destabilizing effect in the long run. Because like we said earlier, this is just a constant vector for disease. But the friars think that this is just fantastic. And they have ordered mission systems and they have mission systems all the way up the coast, almost to Santa Elena. And they have mission systems all the way along the Gulf Coast, almost to to Pensacola. And their presence there has transformed those native peoples. Mm. It, It absolutely has. And so... Something very, very different happens in the backcountry of the Carolinas. They are not trying to missionize the natives. They are only there to trade with the natives. They have no problem trading guns with the natives as long as they use those guns on Spanish um, natives. And so mm. it really is the like perfect prey is what the Spanish create for for the English in South Carolina. The, the Indian slave trade really defines early South Carolina, and that's only because of Spanish Florida. Hmm. It's interesting. Some of the early laws passed in New Jersey in the early 18th century were banning the Indian slave trade with with South Carolina. And you mentioned James Moore, his raids into the Apalachicola area, destroying those missions, resulted in hundreds of indigenous folks being brought back to Charleston and then shipped all over the, the Caribbean and to the the other colonies. South Carolinians didn't really keep too many enslaved Native Americans because it's their home turf. They shipped them out. And again, to to reiterate that point, not only are the Spanish Catholics, which makes them an easy target, because again, that's not what's happening in Charleston, and they are inveterate religious foes. They always have been. But when the Spanish missionize the natives, they huddle them into mission 
towns, reducciones, and they are perfect targets. And the Spanish won't arm them because A, they're afraid of them, and B, they don't want them to be hunters. They want them to be farmers. And they say, we're not going to trade with you for guns. We're going to protect you. So the Spanish set them up to basically be the targets of the slave trade. And that really comes to define this early Charleston in South Carolinian period, obviously it blows up in everyone's face in 1715 with the Yamasee War. And the Yamasees themselves are a really important part of the story because they flee Charleston down to Florida and then they realize that the Spanish are so absolutely inept at protecting them that they flee back up to Charleston and then they end up coming back down to enslave the remaining Floridian natives. And it's just, uh, it's an excellent example of how the Spanish create this system and it just doesn't work for the natives. And it is, it's this Spanish system that is more or less instrumental in wiping a lot of these native groups out. Because a lot of them, a lot of them don't exist anymore. I mean, the Appalachian and the Tamuqua, we can uncover some of their languages, but some of these smaller groups like the Ocala and the Potona and the Makosa, they're gone. And it's because of these slave raids. One of the justification for going to war with the Spanish on any occasion, besides being Catholics, is the issue of the black legend. That's a really important legend that doesn't have a huge Florida chapter, but it does have a Florida chapter. And when you think of the legends that don't make any sense, I mean, I'm a Floridian. I was raised with the Juan Ponce de Leon Fountain of Youth legend. And that that is about the worst kind because that really is just an absolute myth. And I know it hurts people's feelings in Florida to hear that because they're raised with it. But these legends... You know, the Pocahontas legend is is equally as problematic, and that's based off of probably a Florida version. But the black legend is the one legend that actually has the most anchoring in truth and in fact. And the black legend is the black legend of Spanish conquest, which is a sermon, you know, written by Bartolomé de las Casas, a book written by him that just outlines just atrocity after atrocity after atrocity, mostly in the Caribbean, but then moving to Central America, then moving to... South America and Central America and the Yucatan and Florida has a chapter in there and it's and it's he doesn't speak specifically of the conquistadors but he tells the dates he says where they are and he passes some pretty amazing judgment on him he says they are getting what they deserve because everyone who goes to Florida trying dies De Soto died Pamplo de Narvaez died Ponce de Leon dies and he says that they're basically burning in hell for what they did in Florida and they are a small but a pivotal chapter in Bartolomé de las Casas' destruction of the Indies. Well, you describe, uh, you almost had to go to the thesaurus to come up with the words to describe what the Spaniards did. You used the term pornographic, you talked of brutality. So we know that Bartolomé de las Casas was trying to shame everybody into creating laws that accept the humanity of natives. The crazy thing about Bartolomé de las Casas is that he was an encomendero at one point, and he basically has a change of heart, and he becomes this champion for native humanity. And so he writes this account, and again, you know, it's probably embellished in a lot of places because it really is the paintings that go along with it are hard to describe. I mean, they're even worse than than the writing. And yeah, it is it is gratuitous. And you, you wonder how much of that is factual and how much of that is just specifically supposed to get you angry and supposed to appeal to your Christian value, your Catholic Christian values. But again, a lot of it actually happened. A- and his work was translated into English very early on. So again, the English could point to those evil Spaniards. You know, the the, the black legend isn't propagated by Spaniards, that's for sure. It's propagated by everyone else. And the English use it. They say, you know, we have to get to Roanoke. We have to get to Jamestown. We have to stop this. You know, we we can do whatever we want because at least we're not going to be as bad as the Spanish. Absolutely right. And so the name, the black legend, was that applied to this man's work or did he call it that? I mean, where does the term come from? That's more contemporary. Okay. His book, uh, Bartolome de las Casas wrote several, but I think it was like a short account of the destruction of the Indies is his book. And when okay. people read it over time, when they read it, and then all of a sudden you get these uh, these copper engravings that just show the absolute, just mm-hmm. most horrific stuff happening, then it just takes on, it, it takes on the black legend. Right. And Walter, I hate to say this, but we've got to wrap up. Nuts. <laughs> 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 well, Kevin Kokomore. Thank you for being with us today on The Journal. It's been a real pleasure. Any last words? I'm just really happy with this book. I've gotten um, such good response. 
And it's just a pleasure to talk about it. And it's a pleasure to be on the show. So thank you very much. You know, I, I, I'm a, I've, I've been here for 10 years and I, I started listening to your show basically as soon as I moved into the, into the state. So it's, it's a real pleasure to, to talk about this book. All right. Well, again, thank you and safe travels back to coastal Carolina. I hope you enjoyed today's journal. I know that I did, and I hope you learned something. It was a pleasure meeting and talking with Kevin Kokomore. His book, La Florida, challenges how most Americans, especially those in the Southeast, view their past. Spanish sailors discovering the edges of a new continent, greedy, violent conquistadors quickly moving in to find riches, and Catholic missionaries on their search for religious converts. These forces of Spanish colonialism in Florida helped spark British plans for colonization of the continent and influenced some of the most enduring traditions of the larger Southeast. The key history presented in the book, La Florida, will challenge the general assumption that whatever is important or interesting about this country is a product of its English past. Walter Edgar's Journal is a production of South Carolina Public Radio. I'm Alfred Turner, and I produce the show, which is made possible by listener contributions to the ETV Endowment of South Carolina. Remember, the views and opinions expressed on Walter Edgar's Journal are not necessarily those of South Carolina Public Radio or its underwriters. New episodes of Walter Edgar's Journal are published on the first and third Fridays of the month and are available at SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org on the SCE TV app, as well as your favorite podcast provider. We'll talk again soon. Mm-hmm.